Well, it's time for our featured artist again. And uh, today it's a guy from England and his name is Anthony Rotuno. I think he's played music for a very long time. He used to be in a band in Spain called The Backfield Plan. As well as music, he's also a podcaster. He's a great John Lennon person and... Um, We'll talk about that podcast too because it's something you should listen to. So, how are you, Anthony? I'm doing very well, John. Really nice thanks, to be thanks on. Thanks for coming on today. It's always a pleasure to have people. My audience knows that I usually know people very well, but you're actually probably one of the least known of the people that I've ever had on the show. But uh, you're a friend of a friend, really, aren't you? Yeah, don't worry. Nobody's heard of me. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm a friend. <laughs> Nowadays, you don't have to meet people, do you? <laughs> Although it'd be exactly. nice to, but. No, Marv and I are uh, obviously in that Beatles community and I've been on his show, uh, just recorded the second one. You've been on there as well. Haven't you? So I have, yeah. He's a great yes, guy. Yes. A lot of my audience, they mostly know him as Marv Smooth, but yeah, we know him as Martin and Cobell as well. We've all got these strange names. Yeah. So um, we were talking about the Backfield Plan, your band. Tell us about the band. I was in Madrid from 2014 to 2019. I mean, I was 39 when I moved there and I was 40 when I made my first album. Finally got there. And uh, it just came out of, um, there's an Irish pub in Madrid called the Triscoll Tavern, and they have an open mic there. And I wandered in there one day in 2014 and proceeded to meet a whole massive community, mostly of expats, but there were a few Spanish and South American and Cuban, in fact. Our drummer was Cuban. I just stumbled upon this huge community of musicians. And I'd actually been basically a covers act in Asia for about the last well, 10 years or so, my songwriting pretty much stalled. And then I met all these people. And um, the first person I met was a fellow called David Ernstberger, who's uh, American. And we started jamming and one thing led to another. And we met a guy called Custer Jones, who is a musical genius. And he became the lead guitarist. And then uh, that was the core lineup of the band. And then uh, we had various bass players and drummers. And then we eventually got Cuban drummer called Ernesto, who brought a wonderful, he's a jazz drummer, really. So he, he brought a kind of a jazz sensibility to the band. And um, the name of the band as well comes from a song called The Backfield Plan of the Year for a Day, which was written by an old school friend of mine called Ian Hargest. And I just love that name. And in fact, we were going under my name. And then when we did one of the gigs, they said, oh, I would like to, to have a band. Can you think of a name? And we were covering this song, my friend's song. I, thought, I just came to be, oh, the backfield plan. It sounds good because it doesn't really mean anything, but the band's got a plan, which kind of vaguely makes it sound like we know what we're doing. Or <laughs> but it's just a cool sounding name. You know, it doesn't really need to mean anything, does it? No, so, some, some, was names, it. some names, some lyrics, it's better to let people think what they want to think sometimes, isn't it? You know? Absolutely. It just had a nice ring to it and it just felt right. So we went with it. So you're back in the UK now. So what, what sort of takes up your time musically these days? Honestly, I, I made three albums in Madrid and I, I used up pretty much all the material I had. So at the moment, I'm going through one of those periods where I write little fragments. But I'm kind of just honing my musical ability, really, because I've got I play a bit of bass. I've recently learned cajon. I don't know if you know that. It's a box which has a bass and a snare sound. Yeah. So sometimes it's nice to find something new. And I've, I've never learned to play the drums, but I've always had a keen sense of rhythm. So I've been absolutely loving just uh, playing this cajon and then just keeping up, you know, a little bit of piano. So kind of going through a period of just honing my skills and obviously with COVID stuff being confined. And I do a lot of my work online, so I have that kind of life, really. So when, if, when you're trying to write songs, do you actually have any songwriting habit? How do you go about trying to write songs? Or do you just let it happen? What's the, what's the go? Well, what I do is... I also have a blog, so I, I like writing prose. So what I would tend to sometimes find myself doing is writing stuff down, some sort of observation. And then I kind of don't necessarily judge it as to whether it's a song lyric or a prose or a poetry. So I, I kind of do that. And then I can always pick the guitar up and just start strumming a few chords and something generally comes. And I actually have a technique that I found, which is to I have a little Zoom recorder, like a dictaphone thing. And what I'll do is I'll set it recording and then just start playing and sort of try and forget that it's recording. And I'll jam for about 15, 20 minutes. And generally, a little kernel of a good idea will come. And then I'll, I'll stop the recording, listen back and take the good bits. Mm. And then I've always been quite lucky. I've never had to spend too long on one song, although there is one of the ones that we're going to talk about today that that, that was the case. 
but yeah, I set the recorder going really and try not to think too much about what I'm doing. That, that kind of works for me. Well, people know a little bit more about you now than they know before. So the bit they don't know about is they've never heard you. So how about we play a song? I think the first song up we're going to play is a song called Conversations. Tell us a bit about it. Sure, yeah. This was an interesting one because um, I was on a summer break because I was an English teacher in Madrid. And I used to go back to England in August because the summer in Madrid in Spain is pretty brutal. You know, you're talking 40 degrees or more. So, you know, the the old English summer, it's a nice mixture of sun and rain, etc. It's quite inspirational. And I was sitting in a garden and I'd actually, uh, I have a chord book, which I barely touch. I know a decent amount of chords, but I actually decided I'm going to look through this chord book. And I got to A major seven and D major seven. And I love those major seven chords. They have that kind of wistful quality. And I started strumming those two chords. And what I actually had in mind, I was channeling a kind of Paul Simon What's that song? Old friends. Can you imagine us years from today sharing a park bench quietly? And I kind of had this idea, that thing, that the nice thing he does of having conversations between people. And of course, the, the wonderful thing is that the song comes out sounding nothing like Paul Simon. So it's not a case of copying. It's yeah. more just channeling somebody. And I got these two things and I imagined two people and it turned into, I guess, two lovers, I suppose. And it has a kind of sad quality it's like we it's things like we sat watching the wind blow saying all the sad things that we kept in the dark that was that kind of vibe and my uh, my niece olivia happened to be visiting us and as a tribute to her obviously not a romantic one i put in a lyric about her because she was about must have been 17 18 and i've always been very protective because i don't have kids of my own so she's the closest i've got to a daughter so i put in a little uh, verse about her olivia so young and sweet and free and something about, I believe in you, believe in me. And she really loved it. So that was the seal of approval. Cool. And then I had just had a little bit in the bridge. Like I was saying to you, I write stuff down at random times. And I remember being on a beach in uh, Spain, again, on a break. And um, I always found that I took three days to unwind from all the stress. So I started writing all this stuff down. Three days is all I need to da, 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 da. And that became the bridge. So I like the idea of taking little bits from different parts of your life and using them for songs. So that was it. Sounds cool. Okay, well, let's let's play it. So here we go. This is Conversations. We had many conversations Talked of many I broke your concentration And you made me sing We sat watching the wind blow We sat out
but you cannot see. That's a that's a very nice song, um, Anthony. Um, it's got a great intro, nice guitar intro, hasn't it? I mean, I'm always a bit a bit reticent to say these things, but it's actually got a bit of a Coldplay feel to me. You know that, that for yeah. the first few lines that in that sort of I mean, and it's a lovely picture lyric, of course. And um, mm. I mean, how can you go wrong with whistling? Whistling, yeah. I won't tell you how long that took because uh, <laughs> probably as long that, as it's was... taken on some of mine to whistle. That was three of us, I think, whistling. <laughs> and, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a bizarre thing. If, I, if you ask me to whistle, I can do it now. When I yeah. go on stage in front of a microphone, for some bizarre reason, I can't get sound out when I start to whistle. So when we used to play that, the other guys had to do the whistle. And I would just, sort of, you can't see with the audio, stand there pursing my lips, looking like I was whistling. <laughs> just change tack a bit now. Tell us a bit about your, your podcast. I sort of alluded to that earlier, so... I've actually got three now, but the, the I guess the, the pertinent one is the John Lennon one. It's called Glass Onion on John Lennon. I started it coming on for three years ago now. And, yeah, it's just, just been a fantastic journey, really. It's a, it's a deep dive into John Lennon. And I think perhaps what marks it out a little bit from some of the other shows of that nature is that I, I kind of use John Lennon as a, a jumping-off point because I, I, I have a very deep interest in psychology and not so much left-right politics, but how the world really works. And I think John Lennon was very into that idea that the world was a lot different to the way it's presented to us. So I've been amazingly lucky. I've interviewed two of the quarrymen, you know, which was his skiffle oh, yeah. band. Absolutely. And I've been, I've been to one of, the, one of their houses. I went to Colin Hanson's house. He's lived in Liverpool his whole life. He still lives in the area near Petty Lane, in fact, where they used to play. So it just offers something um, quite deep at times, but also fairly light, you know, we sort of take the subject seriously without taking it too seriously, if you know what I mean. We'll, we'll link up where people can find that, but we just, just want to tell people where will they find it? 
I've, I've set up a website which has got basically all my work now. So that's uh, AnthonyRatuno.com. So musically, inspirations. Mm-hmm. Where's your inspiration come from? Very much sixties, I'd have to say. Beatles, obviously. I'd say the Beatles and Bob Dylan. They just tick most of the boxes for me. I would say, yeah, 60s and probably 90s as well, because I think the 90s was the first decade. I was born in 75, so that was the first sort of decade I experienced in real time, if you know what I mean. And Mm. the 90s was obviously clearly a 60s influenced decade. When I first heard Nirvana, I mean, I think Nirvana's music totally holds up. And it was interesting. I just saw a documentary literally days ago where there was an interview with Kurt Cobain from the archives talking about our music is basically a mixture of the Beatles and Led Zeppelin. Mm. And that just totally uh, clicked for me. So 60s followed by 90s. You know, I, I, I liked early Oasis. But yeah, the Beatles and Dylan, really, above yeah, everyone else. I mean, there's so many bands that still, it's a long time since the Beatles. And, but you can, mm-hmm. I can hear influence of them in other bands that don't even know that they're influenced by them anymore. <laughs> yes. Because they're influenced by somebody who was influenced by them. You know, I mean, people like um, Ocean Colour Scene. I mean, you listen to some of their songs, it's just like, tagging on to the end of the Beatles. The day the day I caught the train, is it? Yeah, the day they caught the yeah, yeah. That is it so it's like a Beatles song. We had a band that were quite big in Australia. Oh, the name escapes me, but they were so Beatles like as well. It's amazing. And they never put the Beatles down as their influence, you know, because they, they probably got their influence, you know, as I say, about three times down the line. Yeah. Six degrees of the Beatles. <laughs> <laughs> well Noel Gallagher said something really interesting actually. He's a real music scholar, I find. He said, Helter Skelter created the Stooges, the Stooges created the Smiths, the Smiths created the Stone Roses, and the Stone Roses created Oasis. I don't know if I uh, would always totally agree with that, but it's an interesting, yeah, it's how you get from one thing to another. In a way, I liked Gallagher in that he did say, you know, I'm." he actually said, um, there's a songwriting uh, podcast you may have heard of called Soda Jerker. Mm, It's actually two graduates of Paul McCartney's um, Performing Arts School, which was his old school. And Noel Gallagher said, yeah, you know, I, I rewrote my record collection. And I, I kind of got what he means because it's not, he's not saying that he copied the songs, but I'm, I'm a bit sceptical of songwriters, though, like, as you said, who, who say, oh, I'm not influenced by everybody, anybody. Because as you said, they probably are without realising. But, yeah. you know, I think it's just important to put your own spin on it, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. You know, yeah. you take some raw material, put your own spin on it. Okay. Well, let's, let's play another song. Are we going to play Rows of Empty Chairs? Mm. Tell us a bit about this one. As I said to you earlier, songs tended to come to me quite quickly. This one was a different one. I was actually about to leave Madrid and I was recording my third album with Kester, who is not only the guitarist, pianist, harmonica player, who's also a producer. He's a man of many talents. And we had one song left and I'd been holding this song because I'd been working on it sort of on a nightly basis, just chipping away at it because I never, it was never quite what I wanted it to be. It's based on, um, I think they call it the Travis Picking style. It's the one that Donovan taught to the Beatles yeah. in India, yeah. that famous this alternated picking, which yeah. I always just found very satisfying in my fingers to play that. So I, I had that, and I had that riff going for, I think, literally years. And the song is it's a sort of mixture of a few things, but the rows of empty chairs is a pun on the fact that some of the gigs we played in Madrid Essentially, the, the clubs we would play, they didn't really have a ready-made audience. So you had to sort of bring the audience with you, yeah. which is very difficult because you're almost like, you're kind of like, <laughs> I wouldn't say begging, but you're saying to your friends, oh, you know, please come to my concert. Yeah. So we, we would have um, gigs towards the end with <laughs> probably something like 20, 20 people in them. So the rows of empty chairs was the idea of, you know, playing to an empty hall. And then again, Rose was the name of someone I knew in Madrid. So I, I've always liked my puns. I love my puns. So it's a sort of mixture of a few things. Um, it, it's very vague. I mean, it didn't really have a, a story of any kind. So it was more of, I found a load of lyrics, kept chipping away at it, and they just seemed to feel, they just felt nice. But I think it's all based around this alternated, alternating picking. So, yeah, one of well, my right, favourites. Well, let's play this one then. So this is uh, Rows of Empty Chairs. It is a good pun, by the way. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) She's all
Melancholy feel that one, hasn't it? Mm. I, I love the line "Queen of Nothing." <laughs> <laughs> a rose by another name, a name which is yeah. a Shakespeare it's, thing. It's sort of got a sadness there, but it's got a really good backbeat, hasn't it? And really cool keyboards. But the thing that really mm. struck me, particularly later on, was it had a sort of psychedelic touch to it. Mm. Not heavy, heavy psychedelia, but it had that psychedelic, almost. I guess probably a little bit of Beatles influence psychedelia. I don't know. Of course. But that last bit, you know, I could imagine, you know, that sort of 
era of you know Grace Slick and people like that, that sort of oh, yeah. White Rabbit and that that came across to me in that one. So, but yeah, that's a really yeah nice I think song. it just it's just going to come out in what I do really. That's always going to be there. Yeah, yeah it's an interesting one. What we did, um, luckily, my producer is also like me, a big fan of percussion. So we had um, that was actually with a cajon. That was the only one. All the rest was drums on the mm-hmm. album, but. That was this uh, percussion box, a fellow called Simon, a friend of mine. And then we added uh, shaker and uh, tambourine. And then the sort of secret weapon of that song, if you hear it towards the end, there's this funny sort of creaking noise in the last mm. 10 seconds. Mm. I said to Kester, can we have some sort of drone going? Because interesting, the music with that song is actually the same pattern all the way. It's just picked on the verses and strummed on the choruses. Yeah. But it's actually exactly the same pattern over and over again, yeah. which is yeah. a Dylan thing. So what Dylan does, because his lyrics are so strong, he doesn't need too much musical variety. So it's a bit of that. Mm, mm. And we had this drone and then um, Kessler had a program which had all these sounds. We just tried a load of them. One of them was called Creek, as in C-R-E-A-K. Mm. And we heard it. It was this weird creaking sound. And we thought, oh, yeah, I like that. And uh, we just left it in. And it, I don't know. I don't know what it brings to it. It's, it's much more for you to say as a listener to it. But uh, yeah. uh, no, I was well, happy with that. Works. It definitely works. And you're right, mm. too. Sometimes if you try and put too much musically into certain things, if you're starting to, to challenge people's senses too much, I think you mm. sometimes lose your lyrics, don't you? You mm. know what I mean? And that's it is a tricky one. If you're doing a lot of changes and a lot of moving around, it might be very pretty and very melodic, but sometimes people start listening to that and they lose track of if you want to hear the lyric. I guess at the end of the day, it doesn't matter as long as they enjoy it, but if you want people to hear the lyrics, you got to put something out there that, that's going to give an opportunity to listen to them, I guess. Yeah, because I think one of the ways my songwriters evolved is that perhaps as a sign of insecurity, I used to put too much, there are too many changes. The last song we're going to play is a bit of an exception because <laughs> I'm happy with those changes. But there's other songs I did kind of think with hindsight, perhaps I just put too much into that because I was insecure about whether the song was good enough without yeah. some adornments and everything. So, um, yeah, that's a good, nice mm-hmm. way that my songwriters evolved, I think. That leads to... A- a very good question, actually. They're just perfectly done there. How easy or difficult do you find it to finish a song? Not too bad. I think um, mentally, psychologically, it's got easier because I think as I've got older, I've stopped taking it so seriously in the sense of taking, well, let's say I, I don't take myself so seriously. Probably in my 20s, perhaps in common with a lot, you know, when we're young, uh, perhaps we just take ourselves too seriously and that's one of the things about not wanting to admit you've got influences as well I think Mm. so I think I was much more self-conscious in those days and it is tricky getting over the finishing line you know sometimes but now now I think I you know I haven't written for a while I've been on a bit of a hiatus as I was telling you but in this in Madrid period I found it a bit easier because I just said I'll just go for it and I have to say my producer is very good at just honing the songs and telling me you need to cut it off here it's more a case of almost writing a bit too much and then he would rein me in a little bit. I did rely on him quite a bit, but then other times I'd, I'd bring him a song that was 100% finished. Honestly, I speak to young songwriters all the time mm. and I would say that that would probably be their biggest challenge uh, over almost yeah. anything is about being self-conscious and then drive them into a cycle of not being able to finish anything. Um, yeah. And I know that I've, I've even done a couple of surveys and almost every time that's the, one of the big things that come up is people struggle to finish. But I think, I think you're right. I think it's because they're so self-conscious, they're afraid to let it out into the world as it is. And, and the reality yeah. is you can always do something else, can't you? If, you? if you really want, there's always more you can do and more you can do. And you just got to be able to say, I teach speed writing and I do it more to try and get people, two reasons. One, to get people thinking a different way because it does go, you you then rely more on your subconscious to really the the way you write. But I also, Mm. it gets people into an attitude that you have to finish something in a certain time. And I think Mm. people generally usually do well to a time frame, to be honest, um, Mm. if there's someone who struggles. But but it's, I think you're right. I think it's a very good observation. I think as you get older, I think as you become a bit more comfortable in your skin, all those mm. things were a little bit easier to do. There was one song, I can't quite bring it to mind. It was years ago. I actually wrote, and this is an interesting thing, because script writing, if you write, um, I don't know, like a soap opera or something like that, what they actually do is they have someone who outlines the story and then they get a team of sort of hack writers. I don't mean that in a bad way, but 
professional mm-hmm. writers to fill in the gaps. And there was one song, but I honestly can't remember which one, where I had the beginning and actually wrote the ending halfway through the songwriting process and then filled in the middle. And that was quite nice because uh, I do a little bit of prose writing. And if you're writing a story, again, you have this problem of how do I end this story? So I think a lot of script writers, because I listen to podcasts about this as well, they will actually work out the beginning and end of the story. And then it, it makes you feel a bit more comfortable because then you think, well, I've just got to get the middle bit done, the details, if you like. So um, I don't know if I'd ever be able to do that consciously. I think it just happened once. Yeah. But uh, it made me feel more comfortable. Somehow. Yeah. yeah mm. I, I must admit, I, I'd like to do that. Like you, I, it just doesn't seem to happen for me. So no, I no. <laughs> and quite often the song doesn't end up being where it started from because of that. I'm not saying it's a good or a bad thing it just is often i don't know where the song is going to go until i write the last line or play the last piece of music sometimes the sad ones turn out to be happy and sometimes the <laughs> happy ones have a nasty twist at the end you know but if you know the story if it is a story because occasionally i write a, i guess a story that is uh, maybe even semi-true then you do know the end and you're probably right it's probably a bit easier to finish isn't it yeah i don't think i've ever written a song that was actually i don't know a coherent story i'd quite like to do that to be honest I just don't think it's ever happened. I write prose stories, but for some reason, song lyrics, they just don't really come out like that. You're not old enough yet. (laughs) (laughs) When's that going to happen for me? Do you know, (laughs) what I meant by that was seriously, I couldn't do that 20 years ago. Right, right. But as I've got older, I think I've become more reflective and Mm. I'm more comfortable writing stories about the past with artistic mm. license, of course. They don't, I'm not saying they're exact stories, but I feel mm. more comfortable writing stories than I used to be in my music. I, I like writing stories, but I, I suppose most of the music I listen to, if you, if you, even the great songwriters, it's not really that many songs that I feel are a sort of story beginning to end. They sort of evoke a mood or, you know, if I think of Beatles, I can't really think of a song that's... I suppose, that in a funny way, weird things like Maxwell Silverhammer, which is obviously Paul mm. McCartney, which is a much maligned song. That's <laughs> really the closest. But uh, I suppose it just doesn't come out like that. What about Dylan? Yes. Uh, there's a song, one of his longest songs, actually, is called Highlands from yep. the Time Out of Mind album. It's a great album. Oh, Time Out of Mind is fantastic. That's but in my is, top three. It, a lot of people have written off anything he did in the last... Because it was, a, what would it have been, about 2002 or something? That was uh, 97. 97, was it? Yeah. Oh. Daniel Lamoire, wasn't it? Yeah. Produced. Yeah, well, late 90s then. I think Time Out of Mind's a great album. It's a yeah. right. Always pees me off, that song, the song that he won an Emmy for on that album. No one seems to know he wrote it. Which one was Make, that? Make Me Feel Your Love. Oh, Make Me Feel Love. Oh, yeah, because Adele it, covered it. Won, yeah. It won an Emmy and... Trisha Yearwood and Adele did it, and most people go, I play it, and they go, oh, that's that Adele song. And they go, oh, <laughs> Dylan wrote it. And they go, no, yeah. Bob Dylan didn't write that. Yeah. Well, that's been happening for years, because a lot of people um, didn't know the Mighty Quinn was Dylan, because that was that's made true. famous by Manfred Mann, wasn't it? Well, yeah. what's happening? What's the future hold for you musically? Honestly, I don't know. I, um, I think it just goes in waves. Just very busy at the moment. I have... Um, Essentially, three jobs, three part time jobs that sort of make up a full time working life. Yeah. Plus, I have three podcasts, which is very difficult to run, you know, with all the research and editing and things. And I'm also writing a book wow. based on the Glass Onion podcast. So, podcasts yeah, have I don't know. Do, don't they? Yeah, they do. Yeah. They take a lot of time. Mm. Good thing, don't they? Well, yeah. Anthony, thank you so much for coming on today. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Um, we're going to play out today to a third song of yours, and I think this is one of your favourites, isn't it? The Fool's Guide. So tell us about <laughs> this one. Yeah, this does have quite a place in my heart because um, it's funny. I, I was um, I got involved in activism for a while, and like I said, I'm, I have a very, very keen interest in the, the news behind the news and how the world works. And um, I have a very strong belief that propaganda play such a huge part in the world and that, as you were saying earlier about being influenced without realizing it i think we're being propagandized without realizing it and I, I think the fool's guide it's quite an epic and i think it i think it's one of the few songs i've ever written actually that expresses this other side of me which is a kind of exasperation with how we are led by the nose sometimes by the powers that be there's lots of puns in this as well 
in fact, mm. if you notice, if you see it written down, it's not fool apostrophe S, the fool's guide. So you could take yeah. it as there are fools guiding us, as in yeah. the people in power are often idiots. It switches to waltz towards the end, mm. which is, uh, again is very Beatles. If you think of We Can Work It Out, you know, it suddenly goes into waltz. There's a couple of other John Lennon songs, which I can't bring to mind, but I, I just think it's probably my most complete statement. And it's actually got eight, eight different players on it. So there's some lovely harmonies there. Yeah. Well, I've heard it already, of course, and, and it's interesting mm. listening to what you're saying because my first thought was it's got a, what I call a Beatles lift. There's mm. a point where it moves up, and I, and it got, and I went, oh, just clicked in my mind as a Beatles lift. And I like this, the, the strum, the pattern. It's really, that's the way it just chugs along. It's got, it's, yeah, that's it's a ging, 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 ging. Yeah, yeah, really compelling, isn't it? And it just holds mm. up so well. And that's, of mm. course, there's a great guitar solo in this. Oh, yeah, Kester, brilliant. Absolutely yeah, brilliant. It. And you all know this. It's, sometimes it's lovely in a song where you, you you have a thing that you want to say to the world and you manage to get it in a song and it, and it kind of sounds nice as well, you know. As you said, very beatly. We always laugh because when the when the guitars come in right at the end, as soon as we heard that, we thought, oh, it sounds like Queen. You know, it's, <laughs> it sounds like uh, Now I'm Here, one of those early Queen songs. So yeah, yeah. I love the influences, you know. I don't hide them. I embrace them, you know. If anyone compares me to the Beatles... I'm more than happy with that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, Anthony, thank you very much again for being on, and we'll play out to The Fool's Guide. Thanks, mate. Thank you very much, John. Are your wife and people are grunts back to front and people are dreams oh so it seems and I can't take them right now I can't take them right now can't get out of my bed there's a thought crime running through my head Can't take these rules And people are fools Who believe what they read And believe what they see Believe what they see On the TV Opinions Are like iPhones Everybody's got one are like broken hearts Everybody knows one Wipe them out Wipe them out of my mind Cause I can't take them right now I can't take them right now Believe tools and they'll use them Line them up and school them Or give me a gun and I'll shoot them Most people are nice Fundamentally nice Believe in left hand It's wrong to fly But they're still tools Robbers and figures
Great, uh, thanks Anthony, it was really good to have you on. Um, he's a very, very good musician, Anthony, and a very interesting guy. And don't forget, if you get a chance, that Glass Onion um, podcast, definitely worth a listen to.